There's some incredible insets here that, uh, you know, amaze me because I, I admire art very much. Tell us about, about that and, and the role that it plays in helping you create these figures that you use in your memory tools and then also just helping you remember more information. You're the first person to ever say I'm an accomplished artist. I much appreciate it. <laughs> Because from the medieval times, I started going into the early literate times. In medieval times, art was a critical way of memory because there weren't a lot of books. And so they would use the church windows, memory palace and everything. But they also used art as memory aids that was taught in all the schools. So, yes, what you've been looking at is my visual alphabet, which I've got. An, um, the whole visual alphabet is actually in the book. But the best jury isn't. I'll talk about that in a moment. So peg list, one sun, two, shoe, three, tree, doesn't have enough character for me. Right. And in the medieval times, they also linked them. So I've got A as a racti- I've got the alphabet, the 26. And there's a lot of medieval writers talked about using visual alphabets. And so A is a rachne and she's throwing her web over be the bird, I'm just getting it back for you, over be the bird uh, who's being attacked by the cat, who's being burnt by the dragon, who's burning the eagle, who's attacking the frog, who, and so on right through. Um, my favourite's the skull. Once we get to R, uh, we've got right. a rat sitting on a skull. So you've got a continuous set of images, and for some reason the brain can do images separate to words at the same time without interfering. So when I'm giving public speaking, I've got each of these characters interacting with whatever I'm trying to talk about. So I open a lot of talks with Google. Why on earth, uh, why people say in the age of Google, why do you need to memorise? Well, you do if you don't want your brain to die and Google focuses right down and doesn't give you that big picture, which you'll be finding the same as me. You start to see links that you wouldn't have considered. Right. So my starting character is Arachne throwing her web over the bird. Well, in that, when I'm using it for that, she's throwing a net, the internet, over the bird. So I make that link, and then I've got those interactions happening in my brain and giving me the whole speech. So the right. visual alphabet is hugely useful. I use it all the time. When we're out birding, I use it for my bird list on the way. And I decided to use it for names. But if I meet Mary, I've got M, my little marmoset, but also Martin and and hundreds of others. And the J's, M's and R's in particular are a problem. So I went on then and did a bestiary. I'll just show you a little bit of it. There and this is going to be published as an ebook within a few days and as a print book within a few weeks. And the bestiary is every first two letters that could start names. Right. So for Mary, um, I've got the macaw, and macaws have a lot of markings around their eyes. So when I meet someone, I associate them with that animal. I'm not saying every Mary is a macaw. I'm saying that that's a feature to focus on, because right. I tried the methods of thinking of somebody who also has that name and lots of other methods, but my brain doesn't work that fast. It works very slowly. It's good at logic, but it's lousy at speed and memory. So I have an animal. As soon as I meet someone, I know what animal I'm using, giving me the first two letters. So CH, chipmunk, if I meet a Charles, that's my default Um If it's a little chipmunk, it's Charlie. If it's a big chipmunk, it's Charles. But if I then meet Christian, the chipmunk's wearing a little cross. Right. And so I can add to that. The problem when you meet people is that you start the conversation straight away. So now I stop the conversation. I say, I'm really bad at remembering names, and so I've got this system. I associate you with an animal. Hillary's are a problem because you've got to say I'm associating you with a hippopotamus and some of them think, oh, do you think I'm fat? So you've got to make sure you say, I've got some kind of 
and I'll say something like, hippopotamus, hippos are really dangerous creatures. Are you dangerous? Yeah. <laughs> make a joke. People talk about their animal. Make a joke and then you go on. So you've indicated that their name is important to you. You've slowed down and made the association. Then for the rest of the conversation, I've got this hippo attacking and all sorts of things right. in the back of my mind. It, I've found it a much more successful system. And so I had to paint the whole 77 paintings, which has taken me a long time. But it's worked for me. So you, you had to paint them. This brings to memory something I saw recently about aphantasia that you that you mentioned or aphantasia. Did you have to, because of, of that, you needed to paint them in order for the tools to be usable or? No, I find with other people using this, I've given the full list in the book, they're just sketching them roughly. A lot of people will generate an image in their mind. I happen to have aphantasia where I don't generate any pictures in my mind. I only found out about this months after after I'd finished writing Memory Code, I didn't realise everybody else actually really does see these images. Well, that's a, that's a legend. I'm not sure I believe that, to tell you the truth. I'm, I'm a bit of a aphantasia sceptic. I don't see pictures in my mind, and this is a linguistic uh, twist. But in, in any case... Well, I've talked to a lot of people, and they, they do. It, they can conjure up the image of their parents' face. Mm. I can conjure up my mother or father's face I can't see it I can get a concept of it right. so I do have these images but I can't actually see them in color and clear and everything right. I think the process of drawing them made me engage with the characters so each of these animals is in fact a character now right, right. Um, so DA Dalmatian at the top there has a lot of spots so um I don't think people need to go to the extent of going to art classes and, and painting and creating a book, a quick sketch. And for some people, just reading the words is enough. For me, doing it was partly that I got hooked on it and wanted to understand more about medieval art. Right. Because there's a lot more in the way they design their pages and everything that aids memory that's really useful if you're studying. So do you want to sidetrack into that now? Well... Just to close on this, I've always thought that it must be very a, a distraction to see images in one's mind when you're trying to create, quote unquote, these mnemonic images, right? To to make associations. So if you're memorizing a deck of cards, if you're memorizing someone's name, Mary, or whatever the case may be, I've always wondered at this whole idea that people are seeing images in their mind as being in a, a distraction because I'm very much on the auditory logical uh, or you know semantic I like meaning to things and um, so it, it surprised me when this whole idea of aphantasia even appeared on uh, on the scene uh, as being a thing that people thought was a disease or a condition or a problem obviously it isn't because you have great standing in memory competition so it can't you know can't really be a an issue to this extent it's a difference and, sorry it's just a difference yeah but i'm i'm what i'm curious about is in some of the science that i've seen they show that the same visual centers light up in individuals who apparently see images in their mind and uh those who don't it's just the same uh there's there's not really any difference there but to me I'm more skeptic of the idea that people see pictures in their minds. We use the word image, we use the word picture, yep. but is that really the case? I don't think so. I mean, it's just the way we describe it. And that's different between when I close my eyes and what actually happens in my head. There's no words for what happens in my head. That's part of the point of imagination. Yeah. Well, I've talked to lots of people about it and they tell me, if I say to them, imagine an apple, they will describe the full apple, whereas I'll only have the concept of an apple. Right. If you then ask me to describe the apple, I'll create one without realising that's not what you meant. I have quizzed a lot of people and very few don't seem to see these images. The research show says about 2%. I think to go very, very fast in memory competition doing the logical links, which is what I do, um, probably 
wouldn't allow me to go anywhere near as fast as the five or six, uh, sorry, 14, 12 seconds. What are they down to for a deck of cards? Right. I couldn't, because I have words, mm. I couldn't think them fast enough, whereas they're just creating uh, flashy images. And right. the documentary that just came out on Netflix, Memory Games, mm. following five of the memory champions to competition, is constantly using these flashy images because that's what they're saying they're seeing, mm. whereas they don't see anything like that. Right. Well, I guess I don't want to sidetrack on it. I just, I find it fascinating. And I, yeah, I guess so I'm do an I. Image, I guess I'm an image skeptic just because I don't seem to see them myself either. But in any case. Um, yes, I want to go into that a lot more mm. now that I finished this book. And my passion about it is, too, that I just hear from so many people. I don't see images. I don't have an imagination. And I'm just like, well... Okay, me neither. I mean, uh, they told me I had image deficit disorder when I was in school, but I still managed to learn how to play music. Yeah. I still wrote novels. I still wrote poems. I still, I mean, I'm not, you saw my ET. I'm not a great artist, but you know, I still draw. I don't, I don't let it stop me, but a lot of people are letting it stop them and they're creating prisoner narratives that are locking them in a world of shame and suffering. And I'm just like, what is going on here? That, that, that's crazy. I've read that there is an advantage in that people with aphantasia uh, don't suffer from post-traumatic stress and things like that. Mm. I can't relive, like when my father died, which was very traumatic, I was incredibly close to him, but I can't relive any of that. Mm. And so my brain has just recreated probably false memories, I don't know, of all the good times. And so I, I can't, my husband will take me on holidays and then, I'll have forgotten in a year's time. I can't remember even going. So how much that's a very bad natural memory or how much it's aphantasia, I don't know. But to me, it, it's an absolute blessing because if I hadn't had this struggle with memory, I would never have gone down the path in my research that I have and changed my whole life. 